internet, this is Jacob Clifford. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Now in 2006, a guy named Kyle McDonald traded one of these, a red paperclip, for a two-story house in Canada. Now how? Well, with some negotiation skills, a little luck, and a lot of economics. If there's only one thing that all economists agree on, it's that trade is good. Exchanging goods and services makes people better off. Think of the last time that you bought something at the store. You gave the cashier the money and they said thank you. They gave you the product and you said thank you. But why are you thanking each other? It's because it's a mutually beneficial exchange. You wanted the product more than the money and they want the money more than the product, right? You both win. The economist Milton Friedman said, the most important single central fact about a free market is that no exchange takes place unless both parties benefit. And that's how this guy Kyle ended up getting a house. He traded one single red paper clip for a pen and then he traded the pen for a doorknob, the doorknob for a camping stove, so on and so on until he finally traded and got the house. And each person that traded with him did so willingly because they wanted the other product more than the product that they were giving up. Now this is a super simple concept, but in the econ class, actually determining how individuals, businesses, and countries should specialize in trade gets pretty complex. So put on your seatbelts, it's time to jump into it. There's three absolutely essential concepts that you have to be able to understand and practice. They're absolute advantage, comparative advantage, and something called terms of trade. To explain them, I'm gonna go back to the production possibilities curve that you learned in the last video. Remember, in 10 seconds, I can draw 15 squares using my right hand, or five triangles using my left hand. Now assume that these squares and triangles were something that society actually wanted, that we need. And if I'm the only country in the world producing them, that's how much we have. We can't get any more. But we're talking about trade here, so let's bring in another person that's producing squares and triangles, except they have different resources than I do. It turns out that my wife Paula is ambidextrous, so she can write with her right hand and her left hand. So in 10 seconds, she was able to draw 16 right-handed squares and 16 left-handed triangles. Notice that she can produce more squares than I can in the same 10 seconds. That means she has an absolute advantage in squares. And she can also produce more triangles in 10 seconds than I can. That means she has an absolute advantage in the production of triangles. Absolute advantage is super easy. Just figure out who's better at producing each good or service. Now we're gonna keep the same numbers, but let's convert this over to something that makes a little bit more sense when we talk about trade. So instead of looking at individuals, let's say we're two different countries. Paula Stan and Jacob Land. And instead of squares and triangles, let's convert those over to cars and planes. Again, notice that Paula Stan, given the same number of resources, can produce more cars and more planes. So that means they have an absolute advantage in both. At first glance, you might think that Paula Stan has no incentive to trade because they can produce more of both goods. But no, 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 no. Both countries can still benefit. That's the idea of comparative advantage. Huh? So each country can specialize in just one product and then trade for the other product at a lower opportunity cost than if they produced it themselves. But to figure out how each country should specialize, you have to calculate per unit opportunity cost. We did this in the last video. So for Jacob Land, we know if they produce 15 cars, that's five planes they can't produce. So each one car costs one third of a plane. And one plane costs three cars. That's the per unit opportunity cost. Now for Polistan, each one car costs one plane they can't produce, and each one plane costs one car. Again, that's the per unit opportunity cost. The reason you have to do this is because it puts everything in like terms and helps you figure out who should specialize in what. So who should specialize in planes and make only planes? Well, Jacob Land has an opportunity cost of three cars for each plane, and Polistan has an opportunity cost of only one car. Polistan has a lower opportunity cost, so that means they have a comparative advantage in planes. Right, giving up only one car is better than giving up three cars. And Jacob Land has the comparative advantage in cars because they only give up one third of a plane and Polistan gives up one full plane. The big picture here is to understand that these countries can specialize and trade and get the other product that they're not producing at a lower opportunity cost than if they produce it themselves. And like Kyle McDonald, both countries can benefit from trade. Now, if you're a little confused with the calculations and the math, the per unit opportunity cost, that's okay. A lot of students feel like that. Don't feel bad. Unlike the production possibilities curve, comparative advantage is one of those things that you just won't fully get right away. You have to practice several times before you'll start feeling comfortable. And I still haven't even covered it all. I still have to talk about the idea of terms of trade. 
Now it's time to go to the next level and find something called terms of trade. This is trying to figure out how many cars should be traded for how many planes or how many planes for how many cars would benefit both countries. We know Jacob Land's gonna specialize in cars and they want planes. And if they decide to make planes themselves, it's gonna cost them three cars given up. So Jacob Land will only trade if they can get planes for less than three cars. So if Polistan says, no, we're only gonna trade one plane for like 10 cars, well, Jacob Land is gonna refuse that offer. Why would they give up 10 cars for a plane if they can just produce it themselves and give up three cars? One plane needs to be traded for something less than three cars. Polistan specializes in planes, but they want cars. And if they make cars themselves, they have to give up one plane to do so. So if the terms of trade were one plane for 10 cars, Polistan would totally go for that. But remember, Jacobstan wouldn't. So to benefit both countries, the terms of trade needs to be one plane for something less than three cars, but something more than one car. For example, one plane for two cars would benefit both countries. Each country could specialize in producing one product and then trade for the other product that they want at a lower opportunity cost than if they produced it themselves the benefits of trade. And again, if you understand this conceptually, that's good, but you have to practice. And I haven't even talked about the idea of input questions yet. There's actually two types of comparative advantage questions that you're likely to see in your econ class. There's output questions and input questions. Output questions are like the ones that we just did. We're talking about producing a certain number of goods given a certain amount of resources. So there's only so much time, we're trying to produce as much as we possibly can. An input question is when we're producing a certain amount of products, but the resources are variable. For example, one country might take 10 hours to produce a car, another country might take five hours. Since you want lower numbers, that's an input question. You want less hours, and so the country that has the lower number has the absolute advantage. I'm not gonna do an input question, but my point is you've got to practice. You gotta try output questions, input questions. You gotta practice multiple, multiple times to feel like you're actually getting it. And that's what I'm here for. I'm here to help you learn and love economics. And I have something called the Ultimate Review Packet. The link is in the description below. The Unit 1 Study Guide has an output and input questions and several multiple choice questions to help you understand and practice absolute advantage, comparative advantage, in terms of trade. And as always, I also have practice multiple choice questions at the end of this video, so make sure to stick around. But before we get to that, what is the widget that goes on the wall behind me? The memory tool to help you remember the idea of comparative advantage? Well, you know what it is. It's a red paperclip. Now, when you see this, it's gonna help you remember absolute advantage and comparative advantage in terms of trade, but most importantly, it's gonna remind you that trade is good. Mutually beneficial exchanges make our lives better off. No, 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 give me that. You have the little one. Anyways, like always, in every one of these videos, it's time for a pop quiz. No! If you like this video and you thought it was helpful, please give it a like and please subscribe, okay? Now, let's jump into the multiple choice questions. Keep in mind, they won't be on the screen for very long, so you have to actually pause the video and take a look in the comments below for the answer key, okay? Good luck, until next time.